HMO still refused to treat me. To make a long story short, it took me two and a half more years, but I was finally able to get out of that abusive system, and I was able to get into really good care. And I vividly recall arriving at my new doctor's office for the first time. I arrived lying on a gurney, literally folded up in a fetal position because I'd been bedridden for nearly 10 years. With good care, it took me three and a half weeks to go from being completely bedridden to sitting up in my wheelchair and to walking short distances around our condominium. I distinctly remember saying to John one evening, okay, John, where are you? <laughs> I'm going to get up and I'm going to get you a glass of water and I'm going to get me a glass of water. I don't understand. And, and John sort of whispered back, could it be the care? Because... Believe me, we didn't believe in care anymore, but it was the care. And that's when I became very deeply involved with HMO reform. As I learned about capitation, gag rules, and bonuses for non-treatment, I became the center of many HMO protests. The media was coming to my home, I'd say, once a week at that time. It was wonderful. I was working with legislators. I miss you, Teddy Kennedy, on the Patients' Bill of Rights. And I was speaking at many press conferences. I was doing so much of this work in Los Angeles that people would recognize me in my wheelchair. And while they always remembered that I was a ballerina before, and they remembered the name of the HMO, the, you know, quote, unquote, destroyed my life, whenever I asked them, what is the name of the disease that I have, they could never say back in those days, RSD. So that's when I decided that with great love and support from John, I was going to start For Grace to raise awareness of this potentially catastrophic illness.